Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our Exxon Mobile RSV uh, response uh, knowledge transfer webinar. And um, and we have a, a very interesting uh, roundtable discussion today. Uh, my colleague Tim Nedved will give a, a more detailed description on that. And I just want to go through uh, some bullet points uh, about the webinar format, etc. And uh, for everybody's knowledge that uh, we are going to record the whole session, both audio and the video. And um, <clears throat> so the panelists that has uh, 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 give us the consent to to record, uh, but uh, when we go through the questions, we are not going to announce uh, anybody's name um, due to our examinable uh, internal policy on on data uh, privacy uh, process. Uh, so I put uh, uh, a link uh, for the recordings uh, in the meeting invite. So we post the webinar, uh, all the past webinars are uh, in the API website. Uh, all last year's recordings are on the website already. Uh, I'm gonna keep uploading uh, the rest of the recordings ASAP. And uh, for the webinar, uh, so we normally will uh, organize every first Tuesday of the month from 10 to 11.15 U.S. Houston time. Uh, sometimes we move to uh, other time uh, due to holidays, etc. But but uh, most of the time we'll do the first Tuesday of the month. Um, and uh, for the talks, uh, we uh, normally will give uh, a speakers uh, one hour to speak and then 15 minutes uh, uh, for questions. And if there are more questions, so we'll, uh, we'll just um, uh, answer those questions uh, alive. Uh, normally, we'll, we'll keep the time to the like, question time within uh, uh, 20 to 30 minutes. And uh, for the attendees, uh, you can only uh, type your questions uh, through Q and A button, and we'll, uh, you know, the moderators today will go through uh, the questions. Um, and one thing I would just uh, want to remind you that um, because today is a roundtable discussion, I think it's uh, good to change your view to speaker view so that you can see uh, the speakers when they uh, when they talk. Um, so you can find a view button on your top right of the uh, Zoom window and choose the speaker view if you like. Uh, so now I will uh, turn to my colleague, uh, Tim Nedwa, to introduce the webinar. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, and listen, thanks everybody for attending and, and certainly thank you, Ed and, and Captain Lacario and, and Admiral Austin for volunteering to do this. So I'm going to give a quick introduction of Ed and then Ed, my job this 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 month is going to be easy and Lynn and Art, both our jobs are going to be easy because Ed's going to be the moderator. But I just wanted to say a couple of things. I've known Ed, I think since 2008 or maybe even sooner, the my first recollection, Ed, is when we went to Burns Steakhouse in Tampa and had dinner together. And I just remember <laughs> that's like one of the first times I'd been to Burns. If, if, if you haven't been to Burns Steakhouse in Tampa, I recommend it. It's a unique, it's a unique experience. But Ed has been a loyal listener to the webinar series, and he's been uh, great and kind of sending me suggestions on speakers and, and other things. And Ed had this really great idea of bringing some seasoned incident commanders. So we have Captain LaFerrier and Admiral Austin who have been involved in some important events, um, incidents in the past, and they're going to share with us some of their experiences from that. Ed is uh, was a senior scientific support coordinator um, for NOAA, and he now runs his, his private uh, consulting company called Scientific Support and Coordination. Uh, it's SSNC, and he told me just before we started here that he is the CEO and chief cook of, of that outfit. So with that, Ed, I'm going to turn things over to you, and uh, once again, thank you very much. Great. Thank you, uh, not not Tom, uh, Tim. Um, so uh, just a quick background on how we got here. Um, I, I was talking to Tim back at the uh, Clean Golf Conference in October, uh, basically commending how well the webinar series was going with uh, the presentations of, uh, you know, seasoned scientists and their experiences. And um, we started chatting and I 
I suggested, you know, it's real interesting how the science is gathered, but, you know, how, how does the science matter? Um, and how, how do we feed it to the decision makers? And then how do they kind of sift through it and then end up actually making these big, big decisions during a responses, big and small? So Tim uh, graciously said, sounds like a great idea, you know, kind of pit, pit, pitch me a uh, an idea to use for a webinar. And I reached out to uh, Admiral Austin, Captain LeFerrier, and also uh, Pete Godier, uh, Admiral Pete Godier. Um, and uh, unfortunately, Pete couldn't make it today. He had uh, orders from a higher authority uh, that made today more important for something else, and I to totally get it. Um, so he sent his regrets, but uh, certainly he was on board for uh, the, the importance of this um, topic. Um, so with that, uh, you know, Tim had talked about that the, the goals of this are knowledge transfer from what you have learned from significant events throughout your esteemed careers. And we're going to share what is not in the textbooks, some implicit experiential knowledge so others may not have to go through the hard knocks that uh, we, we've jumped through. Um, so uh, we were asked to um, start out with uh, our paths to the positions that we had. Um, so uh, I guess we're going to tell you how we became involved in the oil spill response field, some of the highlights of our time in the Marine Environmental Response Program, and then get into a, kind of a roundtable discussion of uh, with I'll pepper some questions. I'm going to do my best to uh, summon my David Letterman uh, interviewing skills. I started growing the beard, but it's not quite long enough yet. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to uh, I, I grew up in New York City uh, in the Bronx. I went to Boston University, started out as a uh, pre-vet. Uh, program, veterinary medicine, and uh, ended up graduating with a degree in coastal environmental studies, a kind of big transfer in my um, direction where I combined the biology, geology, and chemistry of the coastal zone. Interesting little fact there, one of my professors who helped me out was, uh, became Dr. Beach. You've probably seen him. He's the guy who rates all the beaches around the world and um, Coincidentally, was one of Miles Hayes's uh, former students and also a, a mentor to me, uh, Miles. Um, from there, I went to the University of Puerto Rico, got a graduate degree in marine sciences, um, four years in paradise. Uh, Puerto Rico is still a, a home away from home for me. Um, then I came back to New York City, got a job working for New York City DEP, the, the Department of Environmental Protection, leading their marine monitoring program for uh, ocean dumping of sewage sludge for the permit from the EPA. Um, while there, uh, Gary Ott, who was the NOAA scientific support coordinator at the time, uh, came out with us to see the work we did. And he told me about the work he did, and I found it fascinating. Um, I was at New York City for five and a half years and decided it was time to, to move on. This was not the perfect fit for me. I started looking around at that time uh, for a job. Um, back in the day when you literally picked up the newspaper and looked in the Help Wanted ads. <laughs> um, and I saw an ad that uh, sounded a lot like a, a NOAA scientific support coordinator. I sent my resume and lo and behold, I got a phone call back from Ann Hayward Walker uh, and an interview and was hired as a contract position to NOAA uh, for the um, HAZMAP program that was started by John Robinson. Um, I worked directly uh, as a contractor uh, through Ann Hayward's uh, company for three years and then John Robinson uh, with uh, you know, the rest of the government decided that the work that the SSCs do is inherently governmental and they needed to be uh, full-time employees. So I had to apply for my job. And luckily, uh, I guess I was doing well enough that they they hired me to do it as a, a government employee. I stayed on for 28 years as the uh, scientific support coordinator in New York City. My area of responsibility was Connecticut to Delaware. Um, I had about 250 incidents where I was the, the lead SSC. 
including the Exxon Valdez, Deepwater Horizon, uh, Athos oil spill in Delaware Bay, numerous hurricanes, the World Trade Center response, uh, uh, biological and radiological incidents, and uh, numerous international uh, responses as well. Um, then in 2015, I uh, became the supervisor for the SSCs from Maine to Louisiana. I kept that position for five years. I retired in 2020. And uh, upon retirement, uh, ran into COVID, uh, started my own LLC. And here I am today trying to be retired, but keep my fingers in the pie and stay stay relevant to the industry. I feel like this is my my payback tour. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to. Uh, so we're going to keep this informal. So I'm going to call you guys Meredith and Roger, um, and I'll let Mary start with uh, her background, how she got here, and then we'll go to Roger and then jump into some of the Q and A stuff. Uh, Mary, hey, thanks, Ed. So the first time it I met Ed was, I think you're in the OSC crisis management course at Yorktown in 1995 or 96. Uh, first time I met Roger when I was in grad school using his uh, uh, his coworkers at the Atlantic Strike Team as my test subjects for my, my uh, graduate uh, thesis project. So uh, we all go way back, the three of us, yes. which, could, which could be good or bad. Uh, we have, we know where each other's <laughs> skeletons are buried. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you for the invite to be here, Ed. Uh, I know this is an important topic, and um, as as you said, anything we can do to help people not have to experience the same painful lessons we did, or at least when they do experience it, they can go, "Oh yeah, Mary and Roger and Ed said that that they did that. That your head shouldn't explode, and here's how to get through it." Um, so I'm very happy to be here. So I graduated from college with a degree in marine science um, from the Coast Guard Academy. Went on a ship, and then after the ship, went to the uh, what was then the 11th district, which was in Long Beach, California, where, uh, I don't know, I think it was within a week of showing up, had my first oil spill, which was when two vessels, the Pack Baroness and Atlantic Wing, collided in clear weather um, off the coast of the Channel Islands in California. And that's when I first learned that um, just because you can't necessarily see the oil and where it's going doesn't mean a lot of people are very interested in what's going on. Um, and so it was very interesting because at the time, again, brand new to marine safety, marine science, um, oil spill response, and just kind of watching how this was pre-ICS days, how kind of kind of like little kids playing soccer, everyone kind of ran and said, I'll, I'll do that, I'll do that. And, and, and five people would do one thing and then you'd see this other thing that should have been handled and it wasn't handled at all. And um, so that was kind of interesting. But these were kind of the pre-Exxon Valdez days where... Yeah, people cared about oil spills, but not as much as they certainly do care about them now. Um, we had a big spill um, up in the, the Bay Area. It was, I think it was 186,000 gallons. I think it was on the news one night. Uh, I could not imagine a spill of that magnitude in California not being headline news for, for, for weeks after. Um, from there, I went to uh, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, where we had one I don't, I don't, it was major for us because they didn't have very many spills there. Um, but we had one spill that required federal assistance showed up. Um, they're like, you're it, you're the team. It was it was my petty officer and myself. And then I'll never forget, it rained the cats and dogs for about 20 minutes. And then when the rain stopped, their oil spill was gone. So I wish oil spills were that easy to clean up. Um, that one certainly was. Um, but again, pre-Exxon Valdez, pre-ICS, um, we kind of were just lucky. I'll be honest with you. We were lucky that everything kind of went and, and no one seemed too upset about it. Um, I went to graduate school in industrial hygiene. And from there, my payback tour was at uh, the, our training center in Yorktown, Virginia, the Coast Guard's training center in Yorktown, um, where I taught has Whopper, has hazard communication, learned about risk communication, which I've been a you know an advocate for for the rest of my career. Uh, and how important it is to make sure that as you're messaging, not only the public, but other responders and other people, you need to understand where they are, um, the level of trust they have in you, the level of outrage they might be feeling or, or emotions they might be feeling. And if you don't 
take anything away from this talk today, it's that it's that you cannot give people too much information and you have to meet them where they are. You can't just talk from the ivory tower and know, uh, you know, I know this information. This is pretty obvious. These people are stupid for feeling upset about it. So I'm just going to tell them that they're stupid for feeling that way about it. That will not end well for you if you do that. From there, I went to Marine Safety Unit Galveston, which no longer exists. Uh, I know they moved it to Texas City. Um, but that really was my first, I don't want to say crucible, but it was, we had a spill a day. I mean, again, I went from my, my last field unit where we had one spill, maybe 10 spills in three years, very, very minor, to within my first day of showing up, having three or four fairly me, you know, medium level spills, and then and then several um, what would be considered major spills offshore happening at the same time, which was always interesting. But it was also my first real experience of using ICS. Um, we taught it at Yorktown, but we kind of didn't, you know, it's like teaching something you never did. So I, you know, I could explain boxology really easily, but until you go to a meeting and you see it actually functioning, um, not a drill, but an actual meeting, and suddenly it'll make sense because it's built organically. It starts from the bottom up um, versus drills where it's kind of, you know, shoved on you. Um, a lot of experience, all the, all the majors um, had their own spill management teams and we would kind of fold in if it was their spill. And, and, uh, and I learned a lot and it was, it was a great place to, to learn about how spill response worked. And also to be, you know, to be blunt, people there, I think because they know about the oil and gas industry, they didn't like oil spills, but they understood that oil spills can happen and provided that the, the responsible party was doing their part to clean it. They kind of left us alone. Those days are gone. I'm just going to say that right now. Um, but it, it gave us the opportunity to learn, um, to kind of make our bones on it. You know, you can make a mistake and you can recover from it. And people, you know, 80 people weren't jumping down, you know, your throat if you made a mistake. So um, it was a great place to learn. Because of that and that experience, my next job was as the, the commanding officer of the Pacific Strike Team. And literally within 30 minutes of my taking over was my first spill. Um, and then the next week was another one. And then three days later was another one. And then two months later was 9-11. So it was just boom, 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 boom of parachuting in because as a st the strike team, I'm not the incident commander. I'm helping the incident commander. Um, I'm whispering to the incident commander. Um, sometimes the incident commander will say, I got other stuff going on. You kind of run this, but it's not your area of responsibility. So you learn very quickly how do how do my folks and me fold into someone else's spill? Um, because if, because that you might find yourself in that situation. If, if you're on a spill management team where you're, or you work for a company that does spill management, it's not your area of responsibility. You don't know the police chief. You don't know the local um, fish and feathers agency heads. So you have to kind of learn where, where do I jump in? Where do I stand back? What are the questions I need to ask? How do I figure out who stakeholders are? All that was very helpful, very good training. Next job was as head of the National Strike Force, the whole thing, where my job was not to be a responder anymore. My job was kind of more of an area command function where I had to manage critical resources. We had Hurricane Katrina, we had Hurricane Rita, Salandang Ayu, where we were folding in multiple iterations, multiple deployments of strike team members from all three strike teams. And I had to make sure we also had enough uh, people left in reserve in case there was another big spill. Um, for, I'll smoosh on the, a, few, a couple of jobs because they're kind of irrelevant here. Um, my next job, I was a sector commander. So any spill between Trenton, New Jersey down to the um, the uh, Maryland border was under my, uh, my purview. Um, I knew how to call the strike team up the street if I needed them to. But this was kind of where my biggest challenge was, and Roger can speak to the same, I don't wanna take his thunder, but Deepwater Horizon oil spill happened during that. And, and one day I got a phone call saying, hey, go down there. Um, so I learned it's good to train people that work for you. It's good to make sure you have a bench strength because I left my unit for three months. I'm like, please, you know, keep, you know, let me know if anything happens. We had a major casualty with a duck boat was, was collided with someone out with a, uh, was run over by a by a, a towboat and they handled it magnificently without me there. So 
Um, delegate, delegate, delegate. Um, moving up the chain kind of was went even from more from tactical to operational to strategic. I was a, a district commander um, from Trenton down to the South Carolina border, had Hurricane Matthew, a couple of other hurricanes, kind of again, as making sure that my incident commanders that were within those sectors had the tools they needed and kind of did oversight to make sure that, you know, could, could whisper to them, hey, call the strike team or hey, you want to do that or hey, you might want to do that. Um, from there, I, I was up at our headquarters doing more policy, um, kind of dealing with things at the, at the national level, working with FEMA, um, working with other agencies, dealing with that. So um, again, started as a worker bee, uh, back as a 10 junior grade back in 87, all the way up to when I retired. Um, every, every step, I'll be honest with you, things have gotten, the environment in which we respond has gotten more complicated, has gotten more complex has gotten more fraught. So um, take what it is that we're gonna give you when you ask your questions and um, and just uh, keep calm. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. The uh, joke we used to have when we were having conference calls during the oil and the sea uh, update was, you're on mute. I'm <laughs> 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 gonna to unclick the, the mute button. Th th thanks so much, Mary. And I, I, we had talked about doing um, more formal introductions, but I think this is a much better way to get into your background. So I, I, I kind of skipped that. So with that, Rod, Ro you mind taking a, a shot at how, how you got where you are? Yeah, sure. Ed, no problem. Um, so I had a degree in environmental science, uh, University of Massachusetts in Lowell, and I took a graduate course in environmental law. And I saw in there the National Contingency Plan. And in that National Contingency Plan was this special force called a strike team. So I did have some early ambitions. And I said, that's what I want to do. And uh, I remember getting interviewed for Officer Candidate School. And they said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be in the strike team. And most of the panels didn't even know what that was. And um, they said, well, you're not going to be guaranteed uh, unless, you know, you, you might not get that job. And I said, I'm, I'm getting that job. And I did. I had the pleasure of serving in two tours in that in that situation. I've been involved in a lot of oil spills, starting with uh, again with uh, Exxon Valdez all the way to Deepwater Horizon. Um, and it, this is going to sound like blowing my horn, but I think it gives you context on my experience. But I was involved in the five largest oil spills in in our history. I also did uh, involved as incident commander in the largest hazmat removal operations in the marine environment. Um, also served a strike team. We did a lot of stuff on land as well, working with EPA. So largest evacuation for a railroad incident, uh, 25 square miles. And, you know, except when I was in graduate school and I had a, a master's degree in industrial and hygiene and also strategic studies from the U.S. Marine War College, um, there was an incident in every unit that I was at. And Larry mentioned, uh, you know, major incidents. We, you know, we classify them in the National Contingency Plan. But in reality, a local incident can be a major incident, right? It impacts the communities in ways that a large incident would. Um, I established a lot of expertise in the Coast Guard. I remember Mary giving me some mentorship and say, be good at something and, uh, and people will ask for your experience. And so I worked uh, very closely with Ed and some other coll colleagues and developed a protocol for monitoring dispersants and in situ burning. Uh, I've also been involved in earthquakes, volcanoes, uh, civil protests, um, and also some law enforcement operations. And Ed, we were going to talk about our highlights, so I'll, I'll go ahead and lead into that as, as part of that other question. So my highlight was um, after we capped the oil spill down at Deepwater Rise, and I got a call from Admiral Allen, and then I got a call from the Secretary Napolitano. And then I got a call from President uh, Barack Obama. That was really the highlight of my career, but not, not the biggest highlight. Uh, I was recognized at Coach Todd Foundation as a hero of Katrina, uh, and also recognized by DS as a national hero, hero for Deepwater Horizon. But these all pale in comparison to the true highlights. Those true light highlights are all the people I had the opportunity to respond with, especially Mary and Ed and, and Pete Godier. But for a lot of you that I see that are on the panel uh, as attendees today, you guys are all the highlight of my experience. 
I'll never forget all of you and the experiences we had. Um, a lot of you are from the industry. You're included in that list. Um, absolutely, we had a comradeship. Um, and the Coast Guard members, state and local agencies, and and that's really too late. What my highlight was. All right, Ed, turn it back to you. Thanks. Uh, I'll just let, let, why don't you just tell folks what you're doing now? Oh, yeah. So I work for the National Institutes of Health, uh, National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, and I am an emergency responder and a preparedness coordinator for a laboratory called Rocky Mountain, Rocky Mountain Labs in Hamilton, Montana. And Rocky Mountain Labs does all the research uh, on animal models for uh, emerging diseases. Um, back in the day, Ebola and then COVID. So all of the animal research is required in order to move on to human trials. And uh, so I had the opportunity to work in something that's totally unrelated to what I did in the past. So I could add that biological uh, response aspect um, to my resume, but it's been fun. It's been great. And um, it's good to be in the response field, not necessarily oil spills. Yep. Thanks, Ed. Oh yeah, thank you, Raj. So kind of getting into the discussion phase here now. Um, so oil spill response and other incidents are complex relationships between many sciences. Uh, these include chemistry, biology, physics, engineering, in addition, sociology, uh, economics, legal, and political factors uh, make also major impacts on this. So um, with that in mind, uh, first question was, what were your first thoughts when I contacted you about discussing why, why science matters to a decision maker? Let uh, one of you yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Um, science is, is very important because it helps me make a more informed decision. Um, you know, I remember back in the day, there'd be, you know, a fishing boat would sink off the coast of Galveston and we'd be wondering, do I need to, to amass a bunch of resources and, and get a bunch of things on the beach, you know, knowing there's gonna be a bunch of people that are gonna need to be clean, cleaning, maybe we're gonna spray dispersants. And then the first thing we would do would be to call up the NOAA SSC and say, please do us the trajectory. And they would do a trajectory and they would find out that it would make a plume about 50 yards off the coast, you know, off the boat, and it's going to dissipate within 120 yards um, just due to the, the characterization of the winds and the waves and the size of the tank. And so we would be able to quickly figure out, oh, I guess we're not going to, you know, we will monitor, but we're not going to have to bring out a whole lot of resources. Or conversely, you know, you would normally it would go west and it would impact a certain beach, but this time of year, nope, it's going to go east. And so to be able to anticipate where you need to have your resources and also get an idea of the magnitude of the, of the spill response, absolutely um, critical in, in, in reaching out to our partners who knew how to use those models. Um, I know that we, I think one of the things was we were with the, with the Cameo and Aloha models, we were allowed to do some things and then we'd always be asking Noah, hey, can't you let us do other things? You know, can't you let us do the trajectory model? And and early on it was no, because we're scientists. We understand how these models work. A lot of things go into these models. It needs a little bit of schmooshing, a little bit of understanding, and there's arrow bars. And um, you really want us to, to do this for you. I and mean, we will get you an answer quick, so don't worry about it. And and right on, um, it, it it saved our, our bacon on a lot of occasions because the people that understood how to use the science were able to use that science and then were able to explain it to us so that we could explain it to our stakeholders why we needed to do what we needed to do. Thanks, Matt. Roger, anything to add or? You know, I would just echo uh, what Mary said. I, th I think it's important to understand that you really can't respond to an oil spill without scientists. Um, they do all the trajectory analysis. They tell you where the oil is going to be tomorrow. And remember, we want to be proactive and not reactive. And, and they provide the opportunity to make sure we get the forecast we need so we can get ahead of the incident. Um, you know, I think as we moved along, as we move along to the future, I think we, see, we should see more scientists involved. I know Ann Haywood Walker was leading um, an effort to identify community health issues how important they are during an oil spill. So I think, you know, we got to think about the social scientists. We got to think about anthropologists. We got to think about even psychologists. Uh, so we take care of what's really, really the impact of the oil spill is not just the environment. 
it's people. And it's not just people, it's their way of life. So if you don't have that mentality, you're going to have a lot of issues. And so really how you gain that knowledge to succeed in addressing those issues is through science. And um, I think that's that really, it's, it's inseparable as far as I'm concerned. Thanks, Ed. Oh, thank you. Um, it, it warms my heart to hear you say those things. Um, I had to, we, we didn't, for the audience, we haven't rehearsed all this stuff. So um, some of the questions are canned, but none of the answers are. So um, let's see, uh, and any specific lessons learned or experienced that you'd like to share with the, the group here? Yeah, I can, I can start on that one. So I know Mary and I, right after Katrina, we're like trying to find a simple way on how to respond to oil spills. Because you remember incident commanders, like we're getting assaulted from all different directions, right? Information demands, questions want to be answered, political, uh, you know, uh, community, the public in general. And so uh, Mary and I came up with the hand model and I think it's, I still use it today. So I'm going to explain that. You won't find it in any textbooks. Uh, you may, may not find it useful, but unless you have some sort of priority scheme, you're going to be in all different directions. So I'll start with a hand model. The thumb are your people. These are the responders. We've got to make sure they're taken care of as far as lodging goes, that they're being fed, that they have this equipment, the safety gear. But one aspect I think we learned from Deepwater Horizon is their mental health. Um, and we did get some mental health folks and counselors out to the field because there's a lot of stress. And when I say responders, I mean all of us, by the way, not just Coast Guard. Um, and you got to take care of that mental health. So that's the first thing you got to do. And remember, the thumb is so important to the hand. Hand really can't function without the, without the thumb. The next is the uh, pointer finger. This is the incident, right? We have to take care of the incident. These are all our resources. These are the oil spill fighters themselves, the equipment we use, dispersants and situ burning, um, any, you know, clean up shoreline, clean up anything we use to fight the incident. And you've got to do that. Uh, the middle finger I will not use except for in its inverse. Um, this middle finger is the boss. You know, some of you might not find that uh, as a coincidence, but you got to take care of the boss. I was involved in the oil spill down in Puerto Rico and um, not, not at the uh, responder level, but the higher ups were not pleased how, how we responded. And some of that might have uh, due, to, due to personality, but I think uh, information was a key to that. And we got blasted. And some of us worked very hard on that spill. And so you got to take care of the boss. The ring finger, the marriage finger, right? This is the public. This is your community leaders. This is your political leaders. You really have to take care of those folks, right? You got to, you've got to make sure you're connected with them. And last but not least, the media. So going down to Deepwater Horizon, I said, all right, we're going to take a look at the hand. <laughs> what do we got? Um, you know, thanks to BP, we launched the largest oil spill response in U.S. history and world history. All right, we were taking care of our people. So the first two fingers were taken care of. The middle finger, uh, my boss, Mary's boss, Admiral Allen, was not happy. And therefore, the president was not happy. So we had to address that issue. We were having a separation with the community. Um, and I'll talk about what, how that looked and why that was a little bit later. So we wanted to gain you know, some of that back. And the media was blasting the heck out of us. So you know, we had three out of the five fingers. But reality, if you don't have any finger, all the fingers, the hand doesn't work. So these are all your battle fronts, folks. It's not just the oil spill. You have a battle front, a war to wage to make sure you get people resources. You have a battle front that's your boss to make sure you keep them informed. You have a battle front for dealing with the media, excuse me, the public and your community leadership. And then finally, the media. What I say battle front is you got to get resources to, to address all of these things. Last but not least, the palm of your hand is you. You have to take care of yourself. And I learned that lesson in Deepwater Horizon. And uh, I won't get into it too much. But anyways, if you don't take care of yourself, the hand falls apart. So that's all I had, Ed. And that's turn it over to Mary. Thank you. I, I love it, Roger. That's it. It's a, a, a simple way to remember all these 
important factors. Mary, Mary your, your turn. No, thank you. Um, just to talk a little bit more about um, right-sizing a response. Um, it's, and I'm going to say rights, I know that's a bad phrase. People are like, oh, right-sizing means, you know, you're going to do what you got to do with the absolute minimum possible. And that, that's, that's not what I mean. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about organization distinctly between, you know, you don't want too many, but you a hundred percent, and this one is more important. You want to make sure you have the resources you need. And this might be really hard because, um, there may not be, let's say everyone has all the money in the world, which they don't, but let's just say you have all the money in the world. You may not have all the responders in the world. You may not have, I know during Deepwater, we had trouble because we didn't have enough trained people in certain ICS positions, right? So what? figure out exactly what it is you need. Try to source to what you need. Um, if you need more public affairs assistance, and yes, you will, you absolutely will, um, because it's not just talking to, um, traditional reporters, you have every, anyone with, you know, with one of these as a reporter, right? So um, you have to make sure that someone is monitoring what's going on. Um, you want to make sure you have enough people in finance, um, the finance section, make sure bills get paid. You want to make sure you have enough in the, in the uh, planning section to make sure that, you know, resources are managed and the situation is fully understood. Um, and fight, fight for that if you have to. And sometimes you have to pick your battles, but make sure you have what you need. And if you feel you need more, if, if in the back of your mind, you're like, yeah, you know, it would really be helpful if I had another couple of people in the such and such section, get more people in the such and such section. It's always easier to get rid of them than to try to get them later. Which brings me to the other point, which is, you know, a response is, um, you know, it's about, you know, you know, here's the response. It kind of it kind of goes like this, right? So as you're going this way, you're not going to have enough resources here. You have enough, and then as as it starts going, you know, down in and what needs to be done, um, it's hard to get people to leave. Sometimes some people can't wait to leave, and it's really hard to keep them there for as long as you need them. And then others, it's like you need to go. We 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 demobilized you. Get out. No, get get away. And so. That also takes a little bit of preparation of the battlefield. If everyone understands when we hit this milestone, this is going away. When we hit that milestone, this is going away. It helps the responders better plan. So maybe not by time, but at least they'll know, oh, okay, I know when these five things are hit, whenever that is, tomorrow or five weeks from now, then I know that my work here is done. But you you want to keep people um, aware and notified of here's the trajectory, here's where we think it's going, this is what might make it go bigger, this is what might make it go smaller. Um, but always keep that in mind. The day you show up, you're thinking about, do I have enough people? Do I need to get rid of people? That's a constant thing. Other thing I want to uh, bring up is if you find yourself as an incident commander, make use of deputy incident commanders. Um, during the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, at the point that Roger and I first showed up, Roger was the IC, I was the deputy. What that meant was the public face was Roger. But if Roger was not, if, if Roger said, I'm gonna be gone, I'll be back in eight hours. Don't make any decisions that need my input until I get back, that would not work, right? So he empowered me to make all those decisions to make sure that the planning P happen, that any little pop-up questions that answered, because you know we, we know each other so well, that you know, ninety nine percent of things I could I could go ahead and handle, and then just leave the you know the few ones that certainly didn't want the IC to be blindsided for for him to find out. You also had a deputy IC for planning because our planning section was so massive that we needed someone with a little bit more experience, and then this allowed the planning section to kind of be broken up into distinct chunks, and then um, the activity happened underneath. Then we had one for. Um, external uh, liaison support. So they, we have this parish president liaison um, program so that each parish president had a senior coastie, um, you know, staple to them so that if they ever had a question, they can just reach out and grab that coastie and get the answer. And we had a deputy IC whose sole job was to not only help them get what they needed, but also to feed up the beast because there was a lot of there was a lot of demand for information of what were the parish president liaison officers doing. 
Then we had one who was the deputy incident commander of go handle this. We need an I-6 to hand, uh, uh, no, you know, we need a captain to handle this. And the ICs are too busy. So you just, just go handle it. Um, you know, there's a lot of flexibility in what you use deputy ICs for. Sometimes, you know, the night, uh, you know, because the ICs in theory need to sleep at some point. So they're, they're, if you have 24-hour ops, we have a deputy incident commander who was the night IC. So think about what are those functions? Again, everything is span of control with ICS. What are those functions that you know have to be done, but require more attention that you could possibly give it and create a deputy IC for that position? That's it for now, Ed. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, so, so much goes on in that uh, incident commander's head. To, it's amazing how everything gets juggled. Um, I'm going to ask you one about um, how how would you respond to the statement, knowing what you know is not enough, you know, uh, dealing with incomplete information, changing information, what you know on day one is different from what you know on day seven and 10. Um, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, I reserve the right to be smarter later. I know one of the um, incident commanders I dealt with for an, an incident, um, he was uh, Basically, a, a micromanager, he could balance your checkbook to the thousandth of a penny, um, but making decisions with partial information, you know, the, 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 um, the phrase uh, analysis paralysis, uh, eventually he gave over the command of the incident to uh, the uh, Atlantic Strike Team CO, and, uh, you know, the, it certainly helped a lot, but... Um, you know, how, how, how do you deal with partial information and changing information on the science level and whatever else is out there? So I spent my, my uh, 2020 um, over at HHS and, and working on COVID. And there was a lot of we don't know information. And so what you have to do is, and if, if you face this where you have scientists that were like, well, I need this to be peer reviewed or it needs, you know, I need to have more to make sure the P value is 0 0.0001. Um, you have to find a way to, to get them to give you an answer. And if you don't have that answer, then you just, you do the best you can. Um, we used to do, especially with oil spills, you know, you write a note to, you know, you write a, a, a note to file. On such and such date, I had this information, this is what I decided, because when you get Monday morning quarterbacked, you know, the next day, four years later, whenever the lawsuits come um, and they go, why did you do what you did? You want to be able to say, well, at the time, this is the information I had. And so you don't want to have to remember what happened four years ago. I, I don't even know what I had for lunch yesterday, much less, you know, something that I might have done in a command post, you know, four or five years ago. So keep meticulous notes. Um, and then also you need to explain not only to your boss, but to key stakeholders. This is the information I had. This is the decision I made. This is what we're doing now based on that information. Um, but I'll be honest with you, regardless of how much you do that and you need to do it, people are going to second guess you. Um, don't let it bother you. It's just, it's part of being a responder, right? You know, everyone likes to throw darts at the person standing up front. So as long as you made the best decision you could with the information you had, um, just, you know, go with it. Now, it, if you know that the decision you're going to make is going to be very monumental and you know that you're going to have better information, you know, in five minutes or the next day, whatever, you're going to have to weigh that. If you have the opportunity to wait to get that information, you wait. But if you don't, you just got to press through. Thanks, Mary. R Raj? Yeah, I agree uh, wholeheartedly. I mean, one of the uh, mantras that General Colin Powell used to say is if you have 40% of the info, that's enough to act. And I've kind of adopted that. Um, it's nice to have the knowledge and experience that an individual has and be surrounded by those folks that have that same knowledge experience. You need to take those risks. You need to trust your instincts, your experience, and the experience of those folks around you. And it's very critical to do that, knowing what you know. Um, you're going to school when you go into an oil spill, whether you realize it or not. So if you think your learning is done when you show up for a spill, you're wrong. Every oil spill is different. I think it was Dr. Jackie Michelle that said one time, 
If you've been to one oil spill, you've been to another oil spill. You've only been to one oil spill. So you have to learn. You have to continue to learn. You have to continue to understand what's going on, what how the oil is behaving. And that's having those folks around you to help to make those decisions. Um, one thing I will, I'll give you another tool that might be helpful. Um, so there is the, uh, the US military has a principle called the DIME principle. It's diplomacy, information, military, and economic as the four major resources. So I changed that a little bit for the oil spill responders and because we like knives in Montana, it's just called the knife uh, principle. Knowledge, negotiation, information, forces, and economic. So forces and economic will put aside right now, but knowledge is key. I think our leadership trusted Mary and I because we had the experience, we had the knowledge, and, and you know, and include everybody that was surrounded us, Ed and all the other scientists. And if you can gain that trust, people are gonna trust your decision-making. If, if you don't have that knowledge, probably won't be able to do those kind of things. So the other thing I would tell you in that knife principle, the most important thing is information. Information, especially in this day and age. And that, a lot of that information comes from our scientists scientist community so that's it ed thank you oh thank you yeah certainly in information is power um so one, one of the questions i had for you guys um uh, you know the pe people out in the field who see what's going on uh and um know what kind of know what needs to be done out in the field and then all of a sudden you know decisions come out of the the unified command where you know the state the industry and the Coast Guard uh, or the federal incident response incident commanders are um, so you know there are actual external expectations um, are out there and there are other drivers that uh, are spe put specific demands on the incident command and you guys want to discuss some of those external pressures be you know there's certainly the the scientific you know formula for making a decision and then there, there's tons of external pressures on you guys and I just I, I don't know if you could discuss some of that for a little bit I think the the behind the curtains view of what goes on and anything that you is not too sensitive to share but uh, I, I think that'd be really helpful for people to hear um so I know um Ron Canton called it the swirl around uh you know everything that 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 goes on in, in addition to just doing the uh, ju just responding to the incident you've got the swirl um um i know julia Kayam and a couple others have have identified that they say that the uh you know that it's the incident plus the event so and the event is all of the things that kind of determine how big the whole situation ends up being right so situation is the incident plus the event if you handle, you know, the incident, you got to respond to it, you know, in a, in a, in a effective and efficient manner, uh, no loss of life, no injuries, um, you know, minimal business disruption, all of that. You can do all that. But if you don't handle all the event factors, which I'll get into some of them here in a minute, you've, you've lost, right? So it, it really doesn't matter. So some of the things you mentioned, Ed, that, you know, obviously you have to feed the media. Um, business and economics is, is a big part. Um, you know, Coast Guard, I know they're, they're, Back in the 90s, they had the best response. They're coming back to, they went back to best response a couple of years ago. They're working on it. So it's the environment, it's stakeholders. Um, what if you, I remember when I was in in, a, in Galveston, there was a spill in Texas City. And, you know, the first thing you want to do is boom everywhere. And, and then you get a phone call saying, we got a tanker coming in. If we don't let that tanker in, we're going to stop gasoline production. It's 30% of gasoline production. The price of gas is going to go up a dollar. This is a 1990, so that would have made a, you know, or 97, that would have been a big deal. Um, are you sure you want to take that course of action? And so there, then you have to balance. Okay, what can we do instead of just closing the channel? You know, will, will it make a, a giant difference in the overall response and how long it's going to take and the damage that the environmental impact? And we were able to, you know, kind of put all of those things together so that. The business people were satisfied. I'm not going to say they're happy because no one's happy in an oil spill, but they're satisfied. Um, we got the oil cleaned up. 
it, there was no uh, more damage that the existing oil spill, you know, so delaying it or, or by opening the boom every so often to let those ships in did not uh, appreciable affect the environment. And everyone was relatively satisfied with, with what we did. To, to me, the trickiest thing from you know, 90s until now is stakeholder identification, because it used to be fairly easy to figure out who the stakeholders were, right? If, if you had an oil spill in a harbor, you know all these surrounding businesses are a stakeholder. If there is a, a school or a fire station or a um, child development center or a hospital, those might be stakeholders. If there's a neighborhood, they might be stakeholder. But during Deepwater Horizon, we found one of the stakeholders were the alligator egg harvesting people because at a certain period of time, every every summer in Alabama, they go and they harvest the eggs and then they grow the alligators until, I don't know, they're about that big. And then they throw 20% back in the wild because that's about how many would normally live. And the rest become, you know, handbags and belts and shoes and, and, and whatnot. And if they missed that window of going in there to get the eggs, they'd have no, uh, you know, no alligators. There, there'd be a they would lose a lot of money. So we were able to figure out the area where they go. We changed the the tactics for that day. They were able to go in there. I think they came to us. I'm, I'm not sure if we were smart enough to go and do outreach to, to identify them, but luckily we did. So, you know, now one of the things that I'm really key on is who are the stakeholders and who can I talk to in this community to help me identify other stakeholders that it might not even dawn on me to think or stakeholders. Raj? Yeah, so I, I agree with everything that Mary says. And I think we oftentimes, uh, during early, early stages, we push off those stakeholders. Oh, no, I don't want to deal with those rabid environmental folks. The reality is you need to think about embracing them and see how they may be able to help you in the long term. So thanks to the internet, um, we now have those who have political aspirations and follow their own agenda. Uh, we have a public that does not believe in science unless it fits within their belief system. I think we saw that during COVID. So that hasn't changed. In essence, what we have is information asymmetry, right? So we responders, and I mean everybody on this call as well, we have knowledge of what's going on during an oil spill, but the public doesn't their information sources are totally different. So what do we do about those kind of things? And I think, you know, I can't overemphasize risk communications that Mary mentioned earlier. In fact, she introduced to me this, this philosophy. You need to know who those stakeholders are that Mary mentioned, but you also need to know how to talk with them, right? So the people of Louisiana during Deepwater Horizon had many things happen to them. Hurricane Katrina, you can even go back to the Civil War where they were one of the few states that had uh, federal uh, you know, military gun governorship. So they've had a lot of issues with the federal government, but it's which key is, is resonating with them and communicating with them in a way that makes a difference. So before Mary and I got involved with Deep Part of Horizon, the, the battle mantra was, we're, gonna, we're not leaving until we pick, pick up every last drop of oil. That doesn't really, that's not really touching the heartstrings of the local public and even the stakeholders that Mary mentioned. What makes a difference is when you say things like, this is impacting your way of life and we're going to help change that as best as we can. That's what, and that's reality. That's what we should be doing. So I would just say that's, it's, it's very important to understand the perspectives, not only of the environmental stakeholders, but also uh, those that might have political aspirations. So the governor of Louisiana at the time, um, you know, had some political aspirations. You need to understand that. You need to understand, okay, how do we gain that individual's trust? How do we ensure that that person gets the need, the need addresses the needs that they want? So I befriended the National Guard general, and I said, sure, you got to help me. You know, how do I reach the governor? How do I get him to understand what we're trying to do to protect his states? That was helpful. Um, and again, I think one of the, uh, I remember Admiral Papp, the Commandant of the Coast Guard saying, you know, Mary and Roger have done, a, are doing a great job to kind of turn things around. Um, and that's because we were actively engaging with the stakeholder community. And, and if I did, you know, there were times and Mary, you know, I had to take a break and uh, Mary took over. So use that risk communications and engage with that community. Don't push them away. Thanks, Ed. 
Hey, Ed, I've got one yeah. more thing I'd like, yeah. like to add. Um, so National Contingency Plan says that there will be a unified command of the federal government, you know, either Coast Guard, EPA, DOD, if it's them, state representation, and the responsible party. This was a huge issue during Deepwater Horizon because people didn't understand why is BP doing that? Why are they involved? Why is the, you know, why is the Coast Guard, the feds taking orders from BP? And why are they even involved? That's, ooh, it's awful. And, you know, and we were like, well, we have to, it's the NCP. And uh, th this is how, and people didn't under, you know, everyone thought it should be, I shouldn't say everyone, but politicians and the media who didn't understand all thought, why wasn't this handled under Stafford Act where the states and the counties call the shots versus the NCP where the feds call the shot and you have the responsible party involved. Nothing has changed. People still don't understand this. Uh, at, uh, you know, in, in full transparency, I have, I, I'm not involved in the Norfolk Southern. I'm just, uh, you know, trained around with that happened um, in March. Um, no involvement with it, just watching as a bystander. But what were the newspaper articles that I saw? Why is Norfolk Southern involved? Why is the EP taking orders for Norfolk Southern? Why? And then they, um, they went after one of the contractors that were hired to do some of the air testing, you know, a, you know, a certified lab that I, I know we've worked with um, over the years. I have friends that work for the company. I'm sure Roger does too. They hire a lot of industrial hygienists. And they were raked over the coals saying, you know, they were paid for by Norfolk Southern. So we know why they found no uh, contaminants in people's houses because they're not even looking for them. And that's, you know, really unfair. Um, so, you know, my charge to you is you need to figure out how do we message this is the NCP. This is what it means in such a way now before a spill so that that is not a piece of ammo that anyone with an agenda could throw back because I'm telling you, it's going to come up again. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know the last train derailment we had uh, was not, will not be the last one. Uh, and certainly we've had them before and it's, uh, you know, instead of sometimes the lessons learned, it's lessons experienced and relearned or re-experienced that uh, occur. And uh, certainly everything you guys said is wholeheartedly supported by myself. Um, to hear. Uh, um, so uh, you, you guys had touched on it a little bit, but um, the whole, uh, and I know there's a question that came in so I'll, I'll ask this one because the uh, great minds think alike uh should social science be included in the mix and i know roger you had mentioned earlier on in the beginning uh, you know it's all about people um how do you see the incident command uh maybe into the future um we, we all know what the past was like um but in incorporating those other uh and i'll say soft sciences uh versus the hard science and i don't mean in in any de degradational way um because I, I i truly believe uh, they are sciences um i don't know i guess roger you brought it up first you want to yeah i think they absolutely need to be included i mean this is like i said this is about a way way of way of life it's it's not just about oil it's about people and there's a lot of mental trauma that goes on with, okay, you can't work. Am I gonna be able to work again? Um, and so you do need to bring these sociologists in. And you know, some of the practices we see in Israel, for example, when they have an attack on their facilities, they, can, they instantly set up what's called a community resource center. And these include health and wellness individuals, people with financial, um, support that they can give to the families or, you know, donations or whatever, kind of like the Red Cross. Um, but that gets set up right away. And it does uh, offer the community some relief and support when these kind of things happen. FEMA does something very similar. They have what's called a, a disaster resource center, DRCs. And uh, they, they, they're kind of missing the psychological as uh, component of it. But I think that's what we need to think about. We need to, we need to look at all the science that could be supportive. I know, Ed, I remember we were in Katrina and you guys early on a search and rescue, you know, you're trying to figure out how you could support us because we had oil spills, but the focus was search and rescue. And you guys reached out to the Census Bureau 
That was awesome because now we could look at area population areas and figure out how do we, you know, where should we focus our rescue efforts? So I think we have to engage the scientific community much more. And, and I believe, the, you know, it's not just putting a science officer next to the IC. It's almost like the safety officer, right? We have safety officers throughout the incident command system. We have them in operations, logistics, and in the field. I think that has to happen. We really need to build a robust scientific support system. That's all I had. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Mary. No, I, I agree with everything Roger just said. The only caveat I would give um, is whoever fills those roles needs to have some training to understand that this is operational, that you're not going to have complete information, um, that this is what, you know, this is what a trajectory of an oil spill basically looks like. So here's the kind of key things and, and where you're going to um, kind of have where points that that'll be helpful. Because if you just advertise and say, hey, we need some sociologists or hey, we need some, you know, psychologists, um, they may not be the right kind and to, to be in the thing. That's that's why I really like risk communicators, because they understand I need a message. I, you know, I, I can look at all that schmooshy stuff and then here's what I need to do with that information to operationalize it to get it out the door so that they don't get analysis paralysis in order to be useful. Th thanks, Mary. Uh, yeah, you know, as we were talking, I um, was thinking the uh, during a response, uh, the, the government uh, government agencies, you know, have a cr crisis incident stress teams, um, and it, it's almost needing something like that for the general public, uh, you know. To and yeah, I guess you, you kind of touched on that, Roger, uh, as well. But it's certainly. Uh, you know, a, a truly emotional event, and they, they have impacts. You know, uh, I, I know there were several suicides during Deepwater Horizon that were attributed to you know people's mental state during the uh, being affected by the response, and so many other studies have come out post uh, on on the effects. So, I applaud you for for thinking about that. Um, so we kind of hit the top of the hour. I'm going to kind of move a couple questions came in from uh, the- uh, let, let me, let me, so Ed, let me jump in oh, for the questions. Okay. And, uh, with fantastic discussion. I'm always impressed with the, with the speaker we have, and this is, this is no exception. So thank you guys uh, so much. And I'm gonna take the selfish prerogative of asking the first question, questions and uh, question and answer. Um, but let me, while, while more answers, so keep adding those questions to the question and answer. We'll try to go through as many as we can. Um, but I'm going to ask kind of the selfish question because my job as working for ExxonMobil, part, you know, one of my jobs is to kind of figure out how we can do things better with new technology and understand the impacts of oil spills. But then a, about a third of my time is spent with advocacy. And so we spend a lot of time figuring out how to get to the right stakeholders and decision makers in peacetime. And it's quite challenging. I'll never forget about five years ago, I was I was leading the, I was the SS, SME on alternative response technologies for a drill we had in the Gulf of Mexico. And we went, you know, we simulated going to the RRT and, and, and promoting the use of dispersants. And not, this is something I've given a lot of thought to over a long period of time. And I kind of laid out what I thought were the really basic facts of why that was an important tool for that specific spill and how, and you know, I had to lay out how mechanical recovery would really be challenged. And I remember the young, I think it was a Lieutenant Commander who was sitting in as the incident commander for that drill, um, said he never heard those facts as kind of straightforward and plainly. And he, it, he, he said it was really easy for him to make the decision, but I, you know, somebody like me can't be at every, every spill. So we need to do a better job of kind of educating even the public affairs people, but finding the decision makers in the Coast Guard, I think you guys, you guys understand that we have to have all tools in the toolbox when we start thinking about large, larger spills that are offshore. And that's what I focus on in my, my research and in my advocacy. But it's the stakeholders and decision makers that are maybe on the political side um, that we have a challenge um, communicating with in peacetime. And if we could do a better job of that, I think decision-making process would be smoother and faster because speed is the key to oil spill response. 
So do you guys have any thoughts on peacetime kind of advocacy? So all tools are, there's more understanding of what the tools, you know, the, the limitations and capabilities of the tools that are in the toolbox, but how do we broaden the understanding to people that uh, will be brought into this stakeholder decision-making role and may not have that? How do we speak to them in peacetime? So uh, I'm going to just jump in quick with the first thought that I had, um, and uh, I think R Roger was part of the, the development of the Alternative Response Tool Evaluation System, uh, the ARTS, and it, it's something that can be used, you know, quote unquote, in peacetime, as you said, or you know, during the, the heat of battle. But try, trying to do some of these um, evaluations ahead of time, identifying, you know, the the critical um, areas when specific responses can be used or shouldn't be used, what type of oil, what season, when what's present. Um, so I, I think kind of we have a tool that's kind of sitting on the shelf and not being implemented enough ahead of time. Uh, and, you know, Noah and the Coast Guard had done a, a, a whole whole bunch of um, environmental uh, uh, risk assessments for specific scenarios ahead of time with um, area committees, probably something else that could be revised. And, you know, tr having these decisions either during exercises or, um, you know, in, in group discussions. So with that, that's, you know, kind of my one and a half cents. So I know ever. When I was in Galveston, we actually used dispersants. Um, I was there four years. I think we used it like four times, but we went through what was there at the time, the RRT's flow chart. You know, you'd start at the top and you work your way through. And if it, at the, the bottom, if you still had all the yeses, then we would, then we would spray. Um, so every single oil spill, so probably hundreds of spills, we went through that because we wanted to have the practice of being able to use it and use it quickly. Um, we got to the answer, yes four times. During the Deepwater Horizon spill, because of the weather, because of the wind, because of the waves, um, because of the product, because it was fresh oil that people kind of forgot that it was a new spill every single day, we got <laughs> to yes a lot, um, which gave some people the impression that, oh, these guys just willy-nilly like to spray uh, dispersants all over the place, when in reality, no, there's a very deliberate process. Um, it just so happened that it, that it was... Um, you know, came up to yes a lot. So that's, I think, one piece of information when you do have those opportunities to talk in peacetime that we need to make a point of is that it's a very deliberate process. You don't use it that often. Um, this is why you would use it. I think the other thing, and I don't know if you're able to do it, we were able to do it during deep water, um, but we had during our, our open houses that we would have in, in lieu of public meetings or the public just sits and yells at you, um, people got to go around to different tables to, you know, to get their questions answered. And they had a dispersant table that Anne Haywood uh, very bravely stood at to get yelled at every night. But they had a graphic that showed here's the components in Corexit 9500. And then next to each, you know, so it had the, you know, I'm not going to say what anything is, but it, let's just say uh, toothpaste, right? So uh, there's toothpaste in it. What else is toothpaste used for? For brushing your teeth. Then there was another product. It's a, you know, a, a surfactant. What else is it used for? It is used in baby shampoo. What else is it used for? Oh, it's, you know, so they went through and showed what household items also had those components of Corexit. So instead of it being this big boogeyman, people were able to understand, okay, I, I understand. I know Noah did a study that, you know, is oil plus Corexit more toxic, less toxic, or the same as just spilled oil? And I think the results of that paper or that study was that oil plus Corexit equals oil as far as toxicity. Um, it's now been 12, 13 years since uh, the spill. I'm, I know there's been lots and lots of studying of the environment. Um, I think when you and I don't have I don't have that information, unfortunately. But if you're able to show, look, 13 years later, here is the impact from the Corexit that was sprayed or the dispersants that were sprayed. And if you're armed with those facts, you know, pre-spill, that might help people better understand and maybe not hate dispersants right now as much as some people seem to do. So that if you do have to use it in the future, barring the people with political aspirations, you'll have an easier time using them. 
Yeah, uh, just what just on, on that the other complicating factor, uh, especially during deep water, and hopefully we don't run into it again. But was the magnitude? If we were yeah. using a thousand, two thousand gallons, like you had said, Mary, you know, in the Galveston area, you used it four times. I'm sure it was nowhere near the volumes that, that was we used during deep water. So that 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 was a critical step as well as the the total volume used uh, and R roger i know you had something to say yeah so um you know i think one thing uh, tim that we can do is and then that's uh what's done in the forest service i think we need to identify who the technical specialists are and um you know the forest service brings in these and you know and type them right from four all the way to one so al allen in my opinion is a type one in situ burn technical specialist and then we need to get this team invited to the Coast Guard planning efforts, the Coast Guard area contingency plans and the EPA's plans. So we recognize this community, right? And there's, there's experts in almost every aspect of oil spills. And so if we start doing that, we can make sure that those folks not only uh, get pulled in, but and there's it's not just the industry, it's all over state folks included. Um, you know, they can be observers and evaluators, you know, to, for these exercises. And if, when I was in the Coast Guard, we always used Coast Guard folks for that. It really doesn't make sense. This gets outside folks, a recognized technical specialist. This guy is, you know, type one technical specialist. Let's bring him in. Uh, and I, you know, there are a lot of industry folks that I think during Hurricane Katrina that, that I hired, you know, that we hired, that I hired, that I needed. Uh, to do evaluations, let's say, on the oil spill, on the oil tanks that were damaged there. I, I can't do that. But if we create this group like the Forest Service has and have a list of those folks, they can participate in arts, they can be at the RT meetings, and they need to be engaged in, you know, in all the exercises in the spill response. Once you get to know each other, you say, we have this within the government, right? So I can say, oh, I need to add. Ed, come up to the spill. And Ed says, well, I'm going to bring in Ann Haywood Walker. I'm sorry, we're not supposed to use names, but, and Dr. Jackie Michelle. And we need the same thing for industry. You know, we need to say, you know what? This person got a lot of experience, like ExxonMobil, for example, on the use of dispersants. Let's bring this guy in as a technical specialist. Um, and I think that's all I had. Oh, the other thing is, you know, you often hear about, well, we should educate people in schools. The school's number one concern is active shooter right now. And they can, barely do the training for that. So I am, I uh, advise the community as a volunteer, I've written their plans for my local community. Um, you know, I exercise tabletop, so on and so forth, as my way to serve the community. But the school systems are not gonna talk about oil spills. They are concerned with active shooter scenarios. So that's all I had, thanks, Ed. Yeah, uh, thanks, hey, let me, I don't wanna take too much time. Let me just follow up quickly. Um, yeah, look, I. The attention of the public is is extreme during an event, but after the event's over, you lose, they lose attention quickly, and your ability to to transfer knowledge to them is is very challenging. So this kind of rapid rapid method of getting knowledge into the right hands and to the right people is is really critical. I think that's where we need to focus attention. I've been promoting for a long time that it needs to be an oil spill response center of excellence, where folks that you mentioned are are listed on a website. So you want to know about this topic, and then we also need to take bring the academic community because they are they are the respected voices, right? And the academic community needs to be, you know, we need to identify those folks who have the, have this knowledge. And it's not necessarily the academic community who's just kind of learned about oil spills um, um, during the event. And I wanted to come back to another to another thing about what what Meredith said and, uh, and really a, an important lesson learned. So we've known for a long time, I work for ExxonMobil, we developed for Exit. Um, products a long time ago, and I knew Jerry Canaberry, who, who developed the original core exit um, formula. He worked with me for a long time before he passed away, and so we knew all these, all the ingredients and all their alternative uses. And he, Jerry Canaberry, chose the ingredients for core exit 9500 from a list of ingredients that were accepted for either human consumption and human context. So we knew he had all these talking points and other things available. Unfortunately, I, hopefully this will never happen again, but unfortunately during Deepwater Horizon, the ingredients for chlorides at 9,500 and 9,527 were proprietary. And it took six weeks for 
the owner of that product, Exxon Mobil, we had licensed it away long before that. It took six weeks for them to release the ingredients of that product. And that was a six week window where all kinds of hyperbole, and this is, you know, everyone could, could, could have conjecture about what was in or exit 9500. And there is, you cannot expect the public to believe that don't worry about it. We have already looked into this and these chemicals were released in the environment. Don't worry about it. We got it under control. We know other things. They need to have that information. There was a vacuum of information about the ingredients of, of the dispersants that were used in that. And that vacuum gets filled by misinformation to mostly, I think. And uh, next time, if that happens again, in fact, dispersants have not been used since the Deepwater Horizon in the United States. Uh, but if it is, you cannot keep a chemical that's released in the environment, uh, a chemical product released in the environment, it, it cannot be a proprietary um, product, right? The ingredients of that product need Tim, to be released whenever it's used Tim, as well. Just, uh, you had mentioned about Oil Spill Center of Excellence. Hopefully, you know, the Coast Guard's standing one up now up in the Great Lakes. Um, so hopefully, as that progresses, uh, it'll become more and more uh, integrated into the, the fields that uh, uh, the information they pr produce will get more in integrated out into the field. Um, we did have a, cu a couple questions on the, um, uh, the board here. One was uh, kind of to get a little technical of all the technologies available to you for an oil spill response, what's one that stands out to you as needing the most development to aid with future spills? Where, sh where, where should some R&D money go? Um, I could start with that. I, I think um, I would say technology needs to catch up to situational awareness. And what do I mean by that? So I'll give you a for example. There were a lot of there was a lot of technology uh, used for uh, situational awareness in Deepwater Horizon, um, but I got a call from the White House Chief of Staff and said, "Hey, um, this reporter, which I'm sure you guys know who it is, I won't mention his name, is standing next to a uh, Paris president, and there's no oil spill cleanup going on, and it's happening right here." So I ran over to the Situation Unit leader and I said, "The person running the." technology, I said, hey, uh, tell me what's going on in this location. So he goes, uh, let me log in. And what was that again, sir? Over here. Okay, got to zoom in. Um, I don't know the answer to that because they didn't have information for what was happening right now. So we made adjustments augmenting that situational awareness by putting physical people in those locations. The next time that call happened, exact same scenario. I was able to go over to the situation unit leader and say, what's going on at Grand Island and why isn't the cleanup happening? Because this reporter and his parish president are there. And he was able to, again, use the computer software to identify who was there in person and made immediate contact with him and then called back and said, there's a lightning storm. That's why they're not cleaning the oil. The White House then went to CNN and said, this is happening. The story was killed. So I think we need to look at how we can use situational awareness tools to augment what we have in the command post. So everybody has this. And why not have an app like we have in Rafale County where the sheriff goes out and say, hey, there's a wildfire happening here and you should be aware of it. And if anybody sees anything, report it back to me. There are, there are technologies out there, but I think personally, I think that's one technology that needs to be uh, leveraged. Pass it on to Mary for any comment. So, no, I 100% agree with you, Raj. Um, I think the other thing is we had aircraft that would fly over to do imagery, but it's, you know, it's a snapshot in time. If there'd be a way to have something on station that could, that we could access, um, that's, you know, not owned by a three letter agency, um, <laughs> to be able to say not only, yeah, there's oil there, but we think it's this thick. Um, and then to me, the holy grail is find subsea oil. Because right now there, there's there's no good way to get at like the group five or, or other sinking kind of oils. And, you know, there were, there were some people during the, once the well was capped and most of the cleanup was done, you know, there was a story of, oh, there's, you know, 25% of the spill that's lurking below the surface and it's going to 
come ashore in the next storm when they're like, no, we don't think so, but we have no way of saying to the public, no, because we have our sensor there, there's nothing there. We can't prove a negative right now. It would be nice if we could do that. Yeah, so what I got from you guys was situ situational awareness, uh, long-term situational uh, air imagery, uh, thickness and submerged oil um, identification. Yeah, I, I know some of those are being worked on at kind of, I'll say, as, as we speak. So hopefully some breakthroughs on that. And um, I guess we have time for one, one, one more question that came in and we, we kind of touched on it before, but uh, it says, thanks for the statements about the importance of people and mental health. How would you suggest that the community health be better included in the various contingency plans, NCP and the EPA plans and in ICS response? Is there any, any suggestions for more formally incorporating them into the decision making or uh, inputs? I I think the hard thing is, you know, while Stafford Act um, does have mass care as one of their emergency support functions, the NCP does not, you know, the NCP basically says clean up oil, clean up hazmat, um, but unless it's something that the 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 Federal Incident Coordinator says this is needed to to for the safety and health of the responders, uh, safety and health of the environment. Right now, including mental health is kind of a hard sell. So if you can't pay for it, it's kind of hard to do. So this might be again where you have your stakeholders working with the looking working with your state reps to maybe get some county folks that might be yes. able to you know, to break into that, to have maybe county health assist at the local level. I'm, I'm not sure if this is something that, you know, if a responsible party, you know, says, I'm going to do this, um, if if even their shareholders or whatever would even allow them to, to, to make those kinds of expenditures. But I think this is something that maybe the state would be a, the place to look to see if there's some ability for them to help. Yeah, so Ed, I would just uh, echo Mary, absolutely. I think the key is to use local community support. And so, you know, one of the things in active shooter scenarios is uh, this creation of what's called the Family Unification Center. And in the Family Unification Center, it's an offshoot of the actual incident. So once the shooter's been um, terminated, which is usually ten, five to 10 to 15 minutes, the big issue now is getting the community back on its feet. So the Family Unification Center is not only for reunifying children with their parents, but to also bring community support, health and, and welfare support from the community. There's counselors, there's preachers, there's you name it, that go to these facilities to help families. So there's a private room for counselors. Uh, we have what's called psychological first aid. I don't know if anybody knows what that is, but I'm trained in psychological first aid, which is if I see a parent upset, I know how to deal with them. And so I think there is a model out there. Um, and maybe we can learn something from the active shooter community and creating something similar to these uh, family reunification centers where they do bring all these even legal resources for the community. Um, and I think that's where you start, is kind of looking what the local community is. And I just want to say something about what Mary said, which is key. You know, the National Contingency Plan is out of sync with uh, with uh, post-911 um, requirements. For example, everything is a local incident, right? Almost every community, even in, out here in the middle of nowhere, River Valley County, we have 2,000 people. We have an emergency operations center that was built through funding. So we need to get those folks involved in an oil spill. And oftentimes we forget about that community. And those EOCs can get a hold of a lot of community resources with working with public health, as Mary said, to bring to the incident on a local level. Yeah, thanks guys. I, I, I think with that, um, Lynn, if you're, you're up to it, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Hey, let, let me just uh, look. I let me just say one quick thing. Please. I'm in. I'm at the airport, and I have my plane is being boarded right now, so I have to leave. So I'm going to turn it over. But I just wanted to say, I'm getting private text messages on my phone, and everyone's saying this is the best. Uh, this is the best yes. webinar we've had. So thank you guys so much. I think this has really been some fantastic discussion.
and I'll leave it at that and leave it over to you and thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I just want to close out and also uh, like Tim said, thank you so much. I really, it's really uh, informable uh, discussion uh, today. And uh, so I just, uh, for those who still on the call, so, um, uh, so for next uh, uh, following month, uh, from June to December, we are going to organize a uh, oil in the sea uh, is a four series, uh, the new oil in the sea. And uh, so next month it will be the overview uh, uh, of oil in the sea, and uh, speaker will be Kursi Tika. And uh, and then the following month, from July to November, will be uh, you know uh, for each chapters. And December will be a summary and recommendation also in a, a roundtable discussion. So stay tuned uh, for our uh, webinar this year. And I uh, really, really appreciate you hang, uh, hang on with us uh, with that webinar. All right. So we are, yeah, the webinar is adjourned. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Nice thank to you. see you. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah,